Hey fourth graders, Mr. B again. We're getting ready for chapter five from The House with the Clock in Its Walls by John Belairs. I got the pups with me. I don't think they're on camera, but they're here. They finally settled down. So uh, it's almost midnight on Halloween. Um, and uh, Lewis has agreed to meet Tarby at the cemetery and Lewis is going to try and raise the dead to try and impress Tarby. Hmm. I don't know about this. If somebody told you, hey, I'm going to raise the dead, um, I don't know if that's something that would make me, you know, really want to be their friend or just make me afraid of them. But we'll see how it works for Lewis. I don't know what you're thinking. So let's see how that works for Lewis. Chapter 5. As the luminous hands of his new West Clock's bedside clock crept around toward midnight, Lewis lay fully dressed under his covers. The room was dark, his heart was pounding, and he kept saying over and over to himself, I wish I didn't have to do it. I wish I didn't have to do it. He felt in his pants pocket for the piece of paper with the magic circle copied on it. There was a fat piece of yellow chalk in his other pocket. What if Uncle Jonathan came to his room to see if he were all right? He'd just have to pull the covers up to his chin and pretend that he was asleep. Tick, 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 tick. Lewis wished that it was next week and that he had never made a stupid promise to Tarby. He closed his eyes and stared at the patterns that formed on the insides of his eyelids. Minutes passed. Suddenly, Lewis sat up. He threw back the covers and stared at the clock. It was five minutes after 12. He had promised to meet Tarby in the cemetery at midnight, and now he was going to be late. What could he do? Tarby wouldn't wait for him. He'd go home, and tomorrow he would tell all his friends how Lewis had chickened out. Lewis rubbed his face and tried to think. The cemetery stood atop a long ridge that rose just on the other side of Wilder Creek Park. You had to walk half a mile beyond the city limits to get to the road that ran up to the ridge. There was a shortcut, of course, but Lewis hadn't intended to take it. Now he had no choice. Slowly, carefully, Lewis eased himself down onto the floor. He knelt down and groped under the bed for his flashlight. It was a long, old-fashioned flashlight with a fluted handle and a big round lamp on the end. The metal felt cold and slimy in his hand. He went to the closet and put on his heavy jacket. It would be cold up on Cemetery Hill. Lewis opened the bedroom door. The hall was dark, as usual, and from the next room he could hear Uncle Jonathan snoring. Lewis felt awful. It was like being sick to your stomach. He wished with all his heart that he could run into Jonathan's room, wake him up, and tell him all about the adventure he was going on and why he had to go through with it. But he didn't do any of these things. Instead, he tiptoed across the hall and opened the door that led to the back stairs. It didn't take long for Lewis get, to get to the other side of town. When he had reached the city limit sign, he poked around by the side of the road until he found a little wooden staircase that ran down the gravel bank to Wilder Creek Park. The creek was fairly shallow at this point, so Lewis waded across. The water was freezing on his ankles. When he got to the other side, he looked up. His hands felt sweaty, and he almost turned around and went home. He was looking at Cemetery Hill. It was a high, flat-topped ridge cut across in two places by a narrow dirt road. It wasn't a hard hill to climb. New Zebedee children went up and down it every day during the summer. But to Lewis, who was scared of heights, it might as well have been Mount Everest. Lewis looked up at the dark hill and he swallowed a couple of times. Maybe if he took the long way around... No. He was already late. Tarby might get bored and go home. The last thing Lewis wanted was to be in the cemetery alone at this time of night. He got a tight grip on his flashlight and started to climb. At the first landing, Lewis stopped. He was breathing hard and the front of his jacket was soaked through. There were black smudges on the knees of his trousers and there was a twig in his shoe. 
Two more stages. Lewis gritted his teeth and went on. At the top of the hill, he dropped to his knees and crossed himself several times. The sweat was running down his face and he could feel his heart thumping. Well, he had done it. It was no great triumph because Tarby had probably scaled the ridge in a tenth of the time it had taken him. But at least he had done it. Lewis looked around. He was standing at the edge of a long avenue lined with willow trees. The bare strings of the willows swayed in the wind, and Lewis shivered. He felt very cold and very alone. At the far end of the avenue, the gray gate of the cemetery glimmered. Lewis started to walk towards it. The cemetery gate was a heavy arch of stone covered with elaborate carving. On the lintel were inscribed these words, The trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised. Lewis pushed open the squeaky iron gate and walked quickly past the rows of white headstones. The mo uh, the mo uh. I have trouble with this word, obviously. The mausoleum was on the other side of Cemetery Hill, the side that looked out across the deep valley beyond the town. A little narrow path led down to the stone platform in front of the tomb door. Where was Tarby? As Lewis looked around, someone said, Boo! Lewis almost fainted. It was Tarby, of course, hiding in the shadow of the stone arch on the front of the, of the mausoleum. Hi, you sure took long enough, said Tarby. Where were you? It was hard work climbing, said Lewis, staring sadly down at his wet and dirty trousers. It's always hard climbing for fatsoes, said Tarby. Why don't you lose some weight? Come on, let's do what we're supposed to be doing, said Lewis. He felt depressed. Why is Lewis doing this whole thing? To try and keep Tarby as a friend? Does Tarby sound like a friend right now? The cracked and mossy stone slab that lay at the doorstep of the tomb was in the shadow of the hillside now. Everything around it lay in bright moonlight. Lewis turned on the flashlight and played the pale beam over the ugly iron doors. A heavy chain held the doors together and it was fastened by a large heart-shaped padlock. Lewis flashed the beam up. There was the strange looking O on the cornice. The wind had died down. Everything was quiet. Lewis handed the flashlight to Tarby and knelt down. Out came the scrap of paper and the chalk. He drew a big circle, then a smaller one within it, like a donut. As Tarby held the flashlight steadily, Lewis filled in the border of the magic circle with symbols from the piece of paper. When he had chalked in the last strange sign, there was still a blank space in the border. Lewis had read in Jonathan's book that you were supposed to fill in the space with the name of the dead person, but he didn't know the name. Well, said Tarby, I don't see any dead people. It's not finished, said Lewis. We've got to put in the name. Tarby looked disgusted. You mean you don't know it? No, I don't, sighed Lewis. Maybe if we sit here for a minute or two, it'll come to us. They knelt silently at the door of the tomb. A sudden gust of wind rattled the dead leaves on an oak tree that grew nearby. Minutes passed. Lewis's mind was completely blank. Then, for some reason, he picked up the chalk. Hold the flashlight down here, he said. Slowly, carefully, he spelled out a name. The funny thing was that he wasn't thinking of a name at all. It was as if someone else was guiding his hand. With one last downstroke of the chalk, he completed the word, Selena. It was a strange name. Lewis had never known anyone called Selena. He didn't even know how to pronounce the name. But there it was. He stood up with the creased paper in his hand. Now. He started to chant in a high-pitched, nervous voice. Abba, bebe, bacha, bebe. He stopped. Tarby, who was crouched beside him, grabbed his arm and squeezed it hard. 
From within the tomb came a sound. Boom! A deep, hollow sound. The iron doors jolted as if they had been struck, a, as if they had been struck a blow from inside. The chain rattled, and there was a clunk on the pavement. The padlock had fallen off, and now, as the boys knelt, terrified, two small spots of freezing gray light appeared. They hovered and danced before the doors of the tomb, which now stood ajar, and something black, blacker than the night, blacker than ink spilled into water, was oozing from the space between the doors. Tarby shook Lewis and squeezed his arm harder. Run, he said. They, stum they tumbled over the bank and started to scramble down the hillside. Part of the way, Lewis slid on his belly with roots scratching at his face. He clawed at the wet, slippery grass, but he couldn't get a handhold. Then he was tumbling over and over, and then he was sliding on his back. Rocks scraped his shoulder blades and bumped the back of his head, and then he was sitting on the dirt road, thoroughly shaken and sick and scared. The moon drifted out from behind the thin veil of clouds and stared down at Lewis as if it were scared too. Tarby was sprawled near him in a weedy ditch. He got up quickly and stared back up the hillside. Now he was tugging at Lewis's arm. Come on! We've got to get out of here! He might, it might come after us! Come on! Please! Come on! Lewis was dazed and shaken, but he got up and followed Tarby over the next stage of the hillside and the next one. They waded across the stream and were soon on the gravel road that led back to New Zebedee. As they walked along, Lewis kept stopping and shuddering. Tarby told him to quit it. I, I can't help it, said Lewis in a sick voice. Did you see it? It, it was awful. I don't know what I saw, said Tarby sullenly. Maybe it was moonlight or something. Lewis stared at him. Was Tarby kidding? Or was he trying to deny to himself that he had seen what he really had seen? Lewis didn't know, and he didn't care. All he knew was that he was terribly frightened. Lewis sneaked back into the house a little before 3 a.m. He tiptoed up the back stairs, checked to make sure that his uncle was asleep, he was, and quietly opened the door of his own room. Just as quietly, he shut it behind him. Then he slowly began to strip off his wet and dirty clothes, which he wadded up and threw into a dark corner of his closet. Where was his flashlight? Tarby must have taken it. He could get it back from him later. As for the clothes, he could get them cleaned without Jonathan knowing about it. Lewis went to bed. He tried to sleep, but all he could see when he closed his eyes were those two burning circles of light. Finally, he did drift off. But he had a strange dream. Clock hands and skeleton bones were chasing him around and around a high stone tomb. Lewis awoke with a start and, for a moment, it seemed that his room and the whole house was filled with a loud ticking noise. I don't know. That didn't seem to go very well. What do you think? Chapter 6. Yeah, it's a double today. The next morning, when Lewis came down to breakfast, Uncle Jonathan was reading an article on the front page of the New Zebedee Chronicle. Curious, Lewis leaned over his shoulder, and this is what he read. Tomb desecrated by vandals. Answers sought to senseless act. Last night, vandals broke into the old Izzard Mausoleum in Oak Ridge Cemetery, the doors of the tomb were found standing ajar, with the padlock lying shattered on the pavement. This incident has sadly marred what was otherwise a Halloween remarkably free from incidents of vandalism and wanton destructiveness. What these human ghouls hope to attain lies mercifully beyond conjecture, but it may be hoped 
Morning, Lewis, said Jonathan, without looking up. Did you sleep well? Lewis turned pale. Did Jonathan know? Mrs. Emmerman was sitting across the table, munching her Cheerios. Does it say whether they disturbed the coffins? she asked. No, it doesn't, said Jonathan. The caretaker probably just shoved the door shut and fastened them with a new padlock. I don't blame him. I wouldn't want to look inside old Isaac Izzard's tome or tomb. Lewis sat down. There were too many things whirling around in his head, and he was trying to get them straightened out. Uh, uh, I was up at the cemetery with Tarby a couple of times, Uncle Jonathan, he said cautiously, but I didn't see any tome with Izzard on it. Oh, well, uh, he didn't want his name on the tomb. Uh, when he had it fixed up for his wife's body, he brought in a stone cutter who chiseled off the family name and carved an omega. An omega, said Lewis. What's that? It's the last letter of the Greek alphabet, and it's used by a lot. It's a used a lot by wizards. It looks like an O, except that it's open at the bottom. It's the sign of the last judgment, the end of the world. Lewis sat there staring at the little O's floating in his bowl. He forced himself to eat a few of them. How come he wanted something like that on his tomb? asked Lewis. He was trying to conceal the tremble in his voice. Lord knows, Lewis, said Jonathan. Say, you're not scared about this tomb breaking business, are you? Old Isaac Izzard's dead and gone. He's not going to bother us. Lewis looked at Jonathan. Then he looked at Mrs. Zimmerman. He knew, as well as he knew anything, that they couldn't wait for him to go off to school so they could discuss the matter alone. So he finished his breakfast, mumbled goodbye to them both, grabbed up his books, and left. Jonathan and Mrs. Zimmerman did indeed want to discuss the break-in alone. Any tampering with the tomb of two powerful wizards like Isaac and Selena, and Selena Izzard was a matter for serious discussion, and they didn't want to frighten Lewis with their talk. But they had no idea of what Lewis had done. Jonathan was not in the habit of peering in at the sleeping form of his nephew during the night, so he had no idea that Lewis had been out of the house. Of course, he and Mrs. Zimmerman had been concerned for some time about Lewis's strange behavior, but they didn't connect it with what had happened on Halloween night. After their discussion, which came to no conclusions at all, except that there was dirty work afoot, Jonathan and Mrs. Zimmerman decided it would be nice to take Lewis on an evening ride around Caffernum County. They knew he loved to ride, and since they hadn't taken him out, taking, they hadn't taken him out in some time, they thought that maybe an excursion would shake some of the gloom out of his system. But when Lewis came home from school that day, he was depressed and worried. He'd been thinking about the tomb business all day long. So when Jonathan pushed back his chair after dinner and asked Lewis if he'd like to go for a nice long ride, Lewis merely shrugged his shoulders and said, Yeah, I guess I'd like to go in a dying cat sort of voice. Jonathan stared at Lewis for a minute, but he said nothing. He merely got up and went to get his car keys. Soon all three of them, Jonathan, Mrs. Zimmerman, and Lewis, were crammed into the front seat of Jonathan's 1935 Muggins Samoon, a big black car with running boards and a windshield that could be cranked open. The car, spewing clouds of bluish smoke, back down the rutted driveway and into the street. They drove for hours as the afterglow of sunset stayed and stayed and the hollows filled with purple mist. They drove past barns with big blue signs on their sides that said, Chew Mail Pouch. They drove past green John Deere tractors parked in deep muddy ruts. Uphill and downhill they drove over bumpy railroad crossings with X-shaped signs that said Rail, Sing, Cross, Road, if you read them the wrong way. Through little towns that were no more than a church, a food store with a gas pump outside, and a flagpole on a triangle of green grass where the roads met. 
By the time it got dark, they were miles from New Zebedee. They were on their way home when, for no reason that Lewis could see, Jonathan stopped the car. He turned off the motor and sat there staring at the row of green dashboard lights. What's wrong, Uncle Jonathan? asked Lewis. I keep imagining I hear a car somewhere, said Jonathan. Do you hear it, Florence? Yes, I do, said Mrs. Zimmerman, giving him a puzzled look. But what's so odd about that? They do let people drive these roads at night, you know. Do they? said Jonathan in a strange voice. He opened the car door and stepped out onto the gravel. Stay here, he said to them. He walked up the road a little ways and stood there, listening. Even with the car door open, Lewis could hear nothing but the wind in the roadside trees and the clattering of a tin sign on a barbed wire fence. The car was parked near the top of a high hill, and now Lewis could see head headlights rising out of a gully and then dipping into the next one. Jonathan came running back to the car. He slammed the door and started the motor. With a squealing of tires, he turned the car around and headed back the way they had come. Lewis was frightened. What's wrong, Uncle Jonathan? he asked. Ask me later, Lewis. Uh, Florence, what's the best way, best other way back to New Zebedee? Uh, take the next side road to your right. That's 12 Mile Road, and it runs into the Wilder Creek Road and step on it. They're gaining. Many times, when he'd been out riding with his father and mother, Lewis had pretended that they were being followed by some car or other. It was a good game to pass time on dull evening rides, and he remembered how he had always felt disappointed when the mystery car turned away into a side street or a driveway. But tonight, the game was for real. Around sharp curves they went, lurching dangerously far over and squealing the tires. Uphills, downhills, then 70 or 80 miles an hour on the straightaway, which was never straight for long on these winding country roads. Lewis had never seen Jonathan drive so fast or so recklessly, but no matter how fast he drove, the two cold circles of light still burned in his rear view mirror. Both Mrs. Zimmerman and Uncle Jonathan seemed to know who or what was in the car behind them, or at least they seemed to know that it was someone that had the power to do them harm. But they said as little as possible, except to confer now and then about directions. So Lewis just sat there, trying to feel comforted by the green dashboard lights and the warm breath of the heater on his knees. Of course, he also felt comforted by the two wizards whose warm, friendly bodies pressed against his in the furry darkness. But he knew that they were scared, and this made him twice as scared. What was after them? Why didn't Uncle Jonathan or Mrs. Zimmerman just wave an arm and turn the evil car into a wad of smoldering tinfoil? Lewis stared up at the reflected headlights, and he thought of what he had seen in the cemetery and of what Uncle Jonathan had told him about Mrs. Izzard's eyeglasses. He was beginning to have a theory about how all these things fitted together. The car raced on, spitting stones from under its tires, down into hollows bordered by dark skeletal trees, up over high hills, on and on while the setting moon seemed to race to keep up with them. They covered a large part of Caffernum County that night, because the, way, because the way around was a long way. After what seemed like hours of driving, they came to a place where three roads met. As the car screeched around the turn, Lewis saw, for a few seconds, a Civil War cannon white with frost, a wooden church with smeary stained glass windows, and a general store with a dark glimmering window that said, Salada. We're on the Wilder Creek Road now, Lewis, said Mrs. Zimmerman as she put her arm around him. It won't be long now. Don't be afraid. The car raced on, dead roadside stalks bent in its hot wind. The overhanging branches whipped along the metal roof. The burning white holes danced in the mirror as before, and it looked like they were getting closer. They had never, since the start of the chase, been more than two or three car lengths away. Jonathan shoved the accelerator to the floor. 
the needle moved up to 80, which was dangerous, to say the least, on these roads. But the greater danger was behind. So Jonathan took the big roundhouse curves as well as he could, and the tires screeched and the fenders almost touched the crumbling asphalt as the side, at the side of the road. This was blacktop, and you could go faster on it than you could on loose gravel. At last they came to the top of a high hill, and there below them, glimmering peacefully in the starlight, the moon had gone down some time ago, was Wilder Creek. There was the bridge, a maze of crisscrossing black girders. Down the hill they barreled, faster and faster. The car behind followed just as fast. They were almost to the bridge when the lights in the rearview mirror did something headlights had never done before. They grew and brightened till the reflection was a blinding bar of white light. Lewis clapped his hands on his eyes. Had he been struck blind? Had Jonathan been blinded too? Would the car crash or... Suddenly... Lewis heard the rolling clatter of the bridge boards under the car. He took his hands away from his face. He could see Jonathan was smiling and putting on the brakes. Mrs. Zimmerman heaved a deep sigh of relief. They were across the bridge. As Jonathan opened the door to get out, Lewis twisted around in his seat and saw that the other car had stopped just before it got to the bridge. Its headlights were dark now, except for two smoldering yellow pinpoints. Lewis could not tell if there was anyone in the car because the windshield was covered by a blank, silvery sheen. Jonathan stood there, his hands on his hips, watching. He didn't seem to be afraid of the other car now. Slowly, the mysterious car turned around and drove away. When Jonathan got back into the mug in Simoon, he was chuckling. It's all over, Lewis. Relax. Witches and other evil things can't cross running water. It's an old rule, but it still applies. You might throw in the fact, said Mrs. Zimmerman, in her most pedantic tone, that Elihu Clabernong built that iron bridge in 1892. He was supposed to be doing it for the county, but he was really trying to make sure that the ghost of his dead uncle, Jedediah, didn't cross the stream to get him. Now, Elihu was a part-time warlock, and what he put into the iron of the bridge... Oh, good heavens, cried Jonathan, covering his ears. Are you going to go through the whole history of Cavernom County at 4 a.m.? Is it that late? asked Lewis. That late or later, said Jonathan wearily. It's been quite a ride. They drove on towards New Zebedee. On the way, they stopped at an all-night diner and had a large breakfast of waffles, eggs, American fries, sausage, coffee, and milk. Then they sat around for a long time, talking about the narrow escape they had just had. Lewis asked a lot of questions, but he didn't get many answers. When they got back to New Zebedee, it was dawn, dawn of an overcast November day. The town and its hills appeared to be swimming in a gray, grainy murk. When Jonathan pulled up in front of his house, he said, There's something wrong. Florence, stay in the car with Lewis. Oh dear, she cried, wrinkling up her mouth. What more can happen? Jonathan swung back the iron gate and marched up the walk. From where he was sitting, Lewis could see that the front door was open. This could easily be explained, since people in New Zebedee never locked their doors and Sometimes the latches didn't hold when they closed them. Jonathan disappeared into the house, and he didn't come back for a full ten minutes. When he did reappear, he looked worried. Come on, Florence, he said, opening the door on her side. It's safe to go in, I think, but the house has been broken into. Lewis burst into tears. They didn't steal your water pipe, did they? Or the Bon Sour coins? Jonathan smiled weakly. No, Lewis, I'm, I'm afraid it's not as simple as that. Someone was looking for something, and I think they found it. Come on in. Lewis expected to find the house in a wild disorder, with chairs and lamps smashed and things all scattered around. But when he got to the front hall, he found everything in order. At least, that's the way it looked. Jonathan tapped him 
and tapped him on the shoulder and pointed toward the ceiling. Look up there, he said. Lewis gasped. The brass cup that covered the place where the ceiling fixture met the ceiling had been pried loose. It dangled halfway down the chain. It's like that all over the house, said Jonathan. Every wall sconce and ceiling light has had its cup jimmied loose. A few chairs were overturned and a couple of vases were broken, just to make it look like this was an ordinary break-in. But we ought not to be fooled. Whoever it was had a general idea of where to look. Come here. Jonathan led Lewis and Mrs. Zimmerman into the front parlor, a more or less unused room full of fussy little red velvet chairs and settees. On the wall over the parlor organ was a brass light fixture like all the others in the house, a tarnished cup-shaped thing fitted to the wall, and a crooked little brass tube sticking out of it. On the end of the tube was a socket and a bulb with a frilly pink shade. I thought you said the cup was loose, said Lewis. It was. It is, said Jonathan. In this case, Hoosis tried to fit it back in just the way it was, which was kind of stupid, seeing as how all the other cups in the house are at half-mast. Some of them are slid all the way down to the socket. But I think Hoosis was trying, in a clumsy way, to keep me from looking too closely at this one. Jonathan pulled over a chair and stood up on it. He slid the cup out and peered inside. When he got down, then he got down and went to the cellarway for a flashlight. When he got back, Mrs. Zimmerman and Lewis had taken turns looking into the cup. They were both puzzled. What they saw inside the dusty bowl was a greenish rust blot. It reminded Lewis of the stuff in the cracks and crevices of the copper Roman coins they played poker with. It was the mark of something that had lain concealed inside the old brass cup for a long, long time. The mark looked like this. In case you don't have your own copy. It looks like a clock key, said Lewis, in a weak, throaty voice. Yes, it does, said Jonathan. He played the light around inside the cup and squinted hard. Uncle Jonathan, what does all this mean? Lewis sounded as if he were about to burst into tears. I wish I knew, said Jonathan. I really wish I knew. So, what do you think it means? A clock key. Somebody broke into the house to get a clock key that was hidden there. Hmm. And something chased them all over the county. Something evil that could be stopped by running water and a magical bridge that had... Uh, protective spells on it. Hmm. Okay, a lot to think about, a lot to talk about. Get on it. And we will be back with Chapter 7 after the weekend.